So we're back and let us now pay some uh, special attention to the solar wind. We, we discussed these transonic solutions and uh, turns out that only solutions of kind 1 and 2 are transonic, right? 1 would be this one and 2 would be this one, right? Okay, so I made a slight mistake when I said this last time, I will rectify it in a, in a minute. But let's now look at the general solution once again, this. And we said that depending upon the constant of integration, you can have any one of these solutions, either solution 1, solution 2, or solution kind of 3 or 4, or for that matter 5 or 6. And we eliminated solutions 5 and 6 because they are not uh, physical. All right, so we really need to, you know, worry only about, about the other kinds of solutions. And of those, only solutions of the kind 1, these, and solutions 2, these, are uh, transonic. They pass smoothly through the sonic point uh, where, um, you know, uh, this represents the square of the Mach number and this represents R, right? So, uh, therefore, um, yeah, yeah. So let, let, let us consider this. This is a little better. This is a slightly larger canvas to talk about. And so uh, let me eliminate this is R. Okay. Only one and two are transonic. One would be this, and two would be this. Okay. And from the general solution, which, what would be the values of C for which you would get solutions like 1 and 2? Turns out that 1 and 2, for 1 and 2, you have okay, in C equals minus 3 in here. If you have C equals minus 3, you will get solutions of the kind uh, 1 and 2. So this is one thing I wanted to mention before proceeding. The other thing I wanted to mention was that I had made a mistake. You see, suppose we are considering the solar wind, right? And so let us now think about what the solar wind means. The solar wind, as I explained uh, maybe a couple of classes earlier, is a wind emanating from the outermost atmosphere of the sun, which is the corona. Okay. And so, and the outermost atmosphere of the sun, it kind of, you know, it essentially boils off. Okay. So, the, the gas or the plasma near the corona is almost at rest. I mean, it has a very small velocity, but it's almost at rest. So it's definitely subsonic, right at the surface of the sun, right? And then it goes out, eventually passes through a sonic point where the velocity becomes equal to the speed of sound and then becomes supersonic. So we, from among one and two, we should choose a solution which is subsonic at small r. And this is the sonic point, Mach number equal to one. So we should choose a solution that subsonic at small r passes through a sonic point and at large r it becomes supersonic, right? So that would be this solution, this branch, 2, right? You see at small r, the Mach number is less than 1. And as r increases, it eventually reaches a sonic point. This would be the sonic point. And as r increases even further, the Mach number increases and, and becomes larger than 1. So, this kind of a solution for which, if I was to redraw the solution, I mean, yeah, redraw this, R, Mach number squared, and this is where it's 1, the kind of solution that looks like this, okay. So at small r, here, Mach number is less than 1. At some, 
here this would be our sonic and here Mach number is greater than one, right? So for larger r, the Mach number is greater than one. And these are solutions of the kind two, and these represents solutions of the kind two represent uh, solutions that are appropriate for the solar wind. I had when we met last, where I had uh, mistakenly said that solutions of the kind one, which which look like this, which are also uh, transonic. They, they would be appropriate for the solar wind. But you see, the mistake there is that solutions of the kind one, which look like this, they are supersonic at small r. That's not what we want. Okay, solutions of the kind one would look like this. R. have one here, right? And um, I would have something that looks like this. These would be solutions of the kind one and this would be the sonic point. Here the Mach number is less than one and here the Mach number is greater than one, clearly. So what does this represent? What could this represent? This could represent gas that is kind of, you know, at rest at infinity at very large distances, you see. And it's attracted towards a compact object. It's trying to accrete onto a compact object. And as it's attracted, as it's accreting, you know, the speed increases and therefore the Mach number increases, right? and it eventually passes through a sonic point, right? And as it accelerates even further, it comes even closer to the star, right? And it becomes quite supersonic, okay? So it becomes quite supersonic. So solutions of this kind represent spherical accretion. Okay, we just uh, discussed this in some detail and we, we said that uh, if we are talking about the solar wind, we really should be talking about solutions like this, solutions like two, which start out subsonic at small radii, pass through a sonic point and become supersonic at large distances, right? So a little bit about the solar wind. This was actually predicted by Eugene Parker back in 1958 simply based on simply based on based on the high temperature of the solar corona simply based on this this fact uh, he surmised that there should be a wind that, that is flowing outwards, okay? This was the main thing. He uh, figured that the pressure at the base of the million degree corona is so high that it has to drive it. It drives or it has to drive it. It has to. Has to drive a transonic solar wind. Well, okay, whether the solar wind has to be transonic or not is another matter, but a transonic solar wind was the most elegant solution, solutions of the type two. Okay, and the actual discovery of the solar wind happened uh, after 1958, in fact. Okay, and I will show you uh, an instance where, um, you know, um, it was shown how Rather, uh, you know, a confirm the observational confirmation of the solar wind uh, was quite interesting uh, the way it happened. Okay, so but it was among the first few instances where the theoretical prediction uh, uh, predated the observation. Okay, so this is quite a brilliant thing. This doesn't happen very often. Okay, uh, most of the time um, there is a puzzling observation 
and the existing theories, existing sort of uh, you know uh, existing understanding does not fit in. So, one has to invent or cook up or whatever a theory that fits the observation. Here you see this was the observational fact that the solar corona was a million degree hot. This was the observational fact and this was deduced from um, you know uh, observations of eclipses and uh, one of the most important eclipse observations uh, in fact happened in Guntur uh, back in 1940s if I am not mistaken and that is when helium was observed. Helium was discovered. Helium was discovered in the in the sun first and then on the earth interestingly enough. Okay. So, I would you know urge you to google discovery of helium. If you google this you will find many interesting uh, several interesting um, pieces of information and you will also find out that uh, helium was discovered using data uh, from a solar eclipse that was uh, observed at Guntur in Andhra Pradesh in India okay, by a French uh, astronomer called uh, Jules Janssen if I am not mistaken. And so, now why am I saying this? This is because this discovery of helium was one of the most important uh, pieces in confirming that the solar corona is actually a million degrees hot. Well, it was suspected to be a million degrees hot earlier also, uh, but th that particular line that they observed was thought to be coming from entirely new el element that they call coronium. Okay. It was only uh, uh, with this discovery uh, that it was you know realized that it was actually uh, an element that was already kind of known and uh, so the fact that the uh, solar corona was a million degree hot was realized uh, soon after the discovery of helium. Now, what Parker did was he figured that if the corona is a million degree hot then the pressure is so high that the pressure in the corona the pressure right there is so high that it cannot be you know the, the, the corona cannot be held back. The outer atmosphere cannot be held back by the gravity of the sun. It has to expand and flow outwards in a manner of uh, reminiscent of solution 2 that we have just discussed. Okay. And this is among the few instances where the theoretical prediction predated the observation. Turns out that this idea was so radical that uh, it was thought to be you know uh, wrong and Parker's uh, seminal paper was actually rejected by the referee. Okay. And uh, it was only after a lot of uh, you know give and take and that Parker finally uh, managed to have his paper accepted and sure enough a few years later uh, the accuracy of the validity of his prediction was proved outstandingly right and uh, this, the solar wind was indeed observationally confirmed. Okay, so, this is quite a remarkable story. In a sense, we are all immersed in the solar wind. You see, the solar wind is something that emanates from the sun and it flows outwards, okay, and uh, it flows outwards and goes on, keeps going on up until it hits, uh, up until I think beyond the orbit of Neptune or even beyond Pluto. Okay, uh, and it continues on until the the ram pressure of the solar wind cannot take it any further. Okay, the the pressure of the surrounding interstellar medium is so large that it acts as a wall, and in some sense it uh, blocks the solar wind. Okay, and that place is called the heliopause. Okay, and in some sense the solar system is thought to be that volume uh, which is permeated by the solar wind. Okay. Up until the heliopause people think of that as a solar system. So, we are of course well well within the heliopause. So, we are also immersed in the solar wind as we speak. We are in, immersed in the solar wind. The solar wind from the sun which is a stream of highly charged particles, hot particles. It is streaming past us, it is streaming past the earth as we speak. We are immersed in the solar wind. The only thing is of course, um, the charged particles do not enter the earth's atmosphere. Okay. Uh, the earth has its magnetic field and the magnetic field protects 
it's the atmosphere from the charged particles entering it. And that's because, you know, uh, if you have a magnetic field like so, and a magnetic field pointing this way, and you have a charged particle, it is caught in the magnetic field. It exhibits, it, um, you know, um, it rotates, okay. It, it exhibits circular motion, and uh, if it also has a component of velocity that's parallel to the magnetic field, the motion becomes helical like this, okay. So, a charged particle that is seeking to enter like this cannot come in, it gets caught in the magnetic field. Of course, how well it gets caught, in other words, how large is the radius of gyration like this or is the radius of gyration like this? That depends upon the strength of the magnetic field, that depends upon the combination, that depends upon two things. That depends upon the strength of the magnetic field and the energy of the charged particle. So, if the earth was somewhere here and this would be the geomagnetic field, which, which sort of, you know, is a, is a dipole like this, uh, you know, the earth is, is something like this and the geomagnetic field is a dipole, okay. So, this would be the north pole and this would be the south pole. If you are standing at the equator, it looks somewhat like this, there is a kind of a, so a charged particle coming in like this gets caught and it, you know, gyrates along the magnetic field. Whereas, if a charged particle is coming like this towards the poles, it has relatively easy access, okay. I am saying all this simply to explain this statement, uh, you know, um, simply to explain uh, this particular statement that we are all immersed in the solar wind, okay. Uh, in other words, we standing here on the earth, uh, we are all immersed in the solar wind. The solar wind is blowing past, blowing past the earth all the way and it goes this way, okay. And the earth kind of presents a bit of an obstacle to the solar wind, but that is okay. The solar wind is, has, has so much ram pressure that it really does not care. It blows right past the earth and goes on uh, beyond the orbit of Pluto, okay, uh, until it hits the heliopause, okay. So, this is the thing and so this is an interesting observation. It kind of tells you how uh, the solar wind was discovered. You see, this is where uh, the sun is. So, the sun is towards here, okay. The sun is somewhere here and this would represent a comet that is blowing past like this. Sorry, the sun is somewhere here and these arrows point in the direction of the purported solar wind, okay. So, uh, here is a comet that is, uh, you know, going this way and uh, I am sure you know about comets. Uh, comets are, uh, you know, objects from the Kuiper belt that often, you know, they are very solar system objects and several of them pass through uh, our field of view every year. And this would be a typical comet and it turns out that it has two kinds of tails, okay. It has what is called a dust tail and these would be essentially uh, uncharged particles. Okay, and this would be a gas tail which comprises of uh, somewhat of charged particles, not all, but some of them. And the remarkable observation was that the gas tails always pointed away from the sun. The gas tails always point away from the sun, somewhat like a kite. Okay, so you remember when you fly kites and you have the tail of your kite, the tail of your kite always points, always blows in the wind like this, okay. The tail of your kite is um, as an indicator of the wind direction. If the wind is blowing like this, the tail of the kite will be pointing along the wind and that is exactly what gas tails seem to do. Okay, they are always pointing away from the sun. It is almost as though there is a wind blowing away from the sun, okay, and that is influencing the tail of the comet. This would be the comet and that is influencing the tail of the comet. More specifically, that is influencing the tail of the comet which comprises charged particles. That is because although we have not, not alluded, we have not talked about magnetic fields at all so far, 
turns out that the solar wind also carries also i mean you know essentially combs out the intrinsic magnetic field of the sun okay and it combs it out into a pattern okay and so what these charged particles are actually doing are they are following the large scale magnetic field from the sun which is drawn out by the solar wind so the solar wind is essential to to this description okay the fact that the charged particles are following the magnetic field which is drawn out by the solar wind that's a secondary i mean you know it's an important effect but that's a secondary effect so in some sense this was one of the first proofs of the existence of a solar wind okay all right so this is one thing but i don't want to leave you with an impression that uh, the solar wind problem is completely solved far from it actually okay there are a few other complications to the solar wind uh, problem it's like this the solar wind uh, uh the solar wind is not spherically symmetric okay although our solution our solution which we just described is a spherically symmetric solution to zeroth order it's a very good description that's the main thing i want to convey here what's more it involves magnetic fields which we did not discuss at all in other words the solar wind is magnetized it's a magnetized fluid which we did not discuss at all okay so this is another thing and what's more the solar wind continuously continually accelerates in other words there is a requirement for extended heating in other words you remember our description what it does is it takes the description of the solar wind which looks like this it takes a hot uh plasma at the base of the corona and it passes it through the sonic point and as it you know uh moves out uh, obviously it's getting cooler that's why it's getting accelerated the the internal energy of the plasma is being converted into the kinetic energy the bulk kinetic energy of the solar wind and that's why the bulk kinetic energy of the solar wind is increasing and uh, you know the mach number becomes larger than 1 and that's fine now turns out that observations are are pointing out that it's actually accelerating more than what this curve would predict in other words there is a need for there is a requirement for extended heating even as the solar wind flows out okay and this is not accounted for in our simple minded solutions so these three points are uh, just to you know give you an understanding but the problem is not really solved yet there are several other interesting features while the basics of the problem are are well laid out by these simple solutions the details and some very important details are far from clear now let me show you one interesting observation which has to do with this point the fact that the solar wind is not spherically symmetric and that is given by this picture what this is there was a spacecraft called ulysses uh ulysses out here and and this this particular swoops is an instrument about ulysses and this is a pretty old spacecraft if you google ulysses you'll you'll find out when it uh, it flew and what the spacecraft did was it took a pass over the sun all the way from the poles from the south pole to the equator to the north pole and back okay and these are actual observations these are observations of the sun taken with the, i mean these are observations which is superimposed okay these are observations of the of the sun taken with the extreme ultraviolet imaging telescope aboard the soho spacecraft and these are observations of the extended solar corona uh, superposed it's not this and this do not come from the same instrument they're superposed here for visual clarity okay and so 
this is essentially the solar corona, the inner solar corona, and these comprise streamers and everything. But these are slightly, you know, th this is for context, okay? This one and this one are for context. What we are really interested in are these lines. Now, what are these lines? These are measurements of solar wind velocity, okay? So you have 1,000 here and 500 here. So what this is saying is that around the equator, you see this is the equator of the sun, and around the equator, the solar wind velocity is around, you see this 500 is here, so this 500 would be somewhere here also. Okay, so around the equator, the velocity of the solar wind is around 500 kilometers per second, something like that, around the equator, here, here, also here. Here turns out that uh, it's even lower, 500 would be somewhere here, for instance, and uh, you know, it's around 500. Okay, however, around the poles you see, 1000 is here, and so this would be something like 800 or so. 800, 900, something like that. So around the poles, you see, right exactly at the pole data is missing, but around the poles, you see, the solar wind velocity is much higher. It's around oh, 800 to 900 kilometers per second, whereas around the equator, the solar wind velocity is lower. Okay, so therefore, the message to take away from this is that the solar wind is Bimodal. There is a fast around, I don't know, uh, seven to eight hundred kilometers per second over the poles and slow, meaning around three to four hundred near equator. This is the message that this figure is telling you. Okay, so clearly this is not a spherically symmetric solar wind. No, a spherically symmetric solar wind would have the same speed irrespective of the equator and the pole, right? So clearly this is not a spherically symmetric solar wind, so this is you could say um, a drawback of the theory that we just uh, you know outlined and uh, what is causing this bimodality well roughly speaking uh, the bimodality is i would really say probably not quite clear caused by the sun's large-scale magnetic field. And uh, these are issues that uh, we will, large-scale magnetic field. So what we will do is uh, we will take this up, we will take things like magnetic fields and everything a little later and when we start uh, incorporating magnetic fields into our equation and start discussing uh, the field of magnetohydrodynamics. So we will stop our discussion of the solar wind here and uh, we will take up a little more about uh, spherical accretion and, and thereon uh, start to discuss uh, uh, disk-like accretion next. So we'll stop here for now. Thank you. <laughs>